Uh, I want to delve into some relational aspects of faith and its impact on education. So let's uh, go to uh, 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2 have a very interesting platform that the Apostle Paul sets, uh, speaking about the cross, about wisdom, about faith, and those of you who have taken philosophy of Christian education know that we refer to this in our earlier classes as we delve into what is the connection? How can the cross be the, the wisdom of God and the power of God? Where is the connection there? But this morning and throughout this week, we'll be referring primarily to verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 5 says, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's just let that sink in. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, first of all, let's think a little bit about uh, faith. What is faith? And, of course, we can go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which gives us the classic definition. And, in fact, let's just do that. Hebrews 11 and verse 1, we read, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Um, that essence of what we hope for and the evidence of things that we have not seen. Now notice evidence is very different from a demonstration. Evidence is is those building blocks upon which you can establish the expectation that something will happen. So it's very important to understand this. In fact, uh, this is something we, we uh, deal with when we're thinking about critical thinking, to examine evidence. And God gives us sufficient evidence to have faith in Him, but He doesn't give us a full demonstration that will remove any room for doubt. Therefore, we have to exert faith. And this is something we will have to exercise throughout eternity because who can enter fully into the mind of God? He is God. It's one of the simplest things for us to try to realize that we can grasp that is just think. And I'm sure each one of you, when you were a child, probably came to this uh, uh, thought, uh, this thought came to your mind. You try to go back and back and back in time and think when God started. And you go further back and further back, and finally your mind just gets boggled and says, it just doesn't make sense, you know, that he's always been there. Our minds cannot grasp that. Something else that our minds cannot grasp is the, is the aspect of the, the an infinite universe. So you travel, you travel millions and millions of light years, and you continue traveling, and then when you get there, a million years of traveling at, at the light of speed, you reach there, and there is still infinity beyond. Can we grasp that? We cannot. So if, when we can grasp infinity in our minds and see it, that's, uh, if I could use that analogy, then we're getting closer to being able to understand the mind of God. And when will that be? Never, never. Uh, however, God reveals enough of himself. He gives us enough evidence so that we can build our faith on him. He gives us enough evidence. Faith is, in reality, something relational. What do I mean by that? You believe in people. In our Western mindset, uh, developed on the Greek system of, of uh, wisdom, you believe in concepts. But if you go deeper and if you look in the Hebrew mindset, belief is in persons. Because concepts, and in the biblical sense, where do concepts emerge from? A concept is simply an understanding that is expressed of something that is an attribute of God or His creation. Uh, how He relates to us. It has to do with Him. In fact, Jesus said, I am the truth. Truth which is normally considered a concept in the Bible and in God is considered a person. I am the truth. And that is very, that is very amazing because it really shows us that there is nothing abstract in God. We can conceptualize about Him, but in the essence, God is a person. Amen. He is a person. That is uh, wonderful. 
amazing. So if we have faith in Him, if we trust Him, if we believe in Him, then things will be so different. Now, let's, I know it's a challenge for us to believe in Him, and there are so many reasons uh, for us to, to doubt Him. In fact, in the very beginning, and let's go to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. In the beginning, says Genesis 1, verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And as you continue to read that uh, solemn chapter, in the beginning, God did this. In the beginning, you see his creative power building up until the sixth day when he creates man, Adam and Eve. And not only as he creates, it says, and God saw what he had done, and it was good. Not only does, it, does he say it was good, at times he says it was very good. And uh, if there could be something gooder, using that new construction there, uh, then what God does, he adds the emphasis, very good. Furthermore, even though it was very good, he plants a garden and makes it extra special so that he could place Adam and Eve there. He made provision for all what they could ever uh, think of wanting. Plus, he created them with the ability to experience these wants and to enjoy as they satisfied those needs. Haven't you noticed when you look at yourself, when you study physiology, that every need we have is actually an opportunity to experience satisfaction and pleasure? Every single need. Therefore, God meant our existence to be pleasurable, enjoyable. But he meant it to be pleasurable and enjoyable to the utmost within the purpose of ever growing and becoming more and more like him. And he is love. He did not want us to become depraved, and we will talk about that later on this week. Therefore, he, he established certain parameters to ensure that that happiness would continue. That happiness would not only continue, but that happiness would increase. Now, you, you we as human beings, you experience happiness today. Say something, a, a great highlight uh, today. And when you experience that, haven't you thought at times, I wonder how long this ecstasy will last. Haven't you ever wondered when you're going through a really good time? I wonder, how, I, I wonder how long this will last because in our life, you have ecstasy and high moments and then what comes? A valley, a valley. You, you receive a phone call. A dear aunt back home is on deathbed. She's very sick. Or you receive a phone call. Someone suffered a car accident and, and this happened. And uh, in, in fact, when I, early on when I became a parent, I was a little bit um, inside where no one else could see, paranoid. And when I, someone would come hurriedly to give me news of something, I would think that it was something bad had happened to uh, one of my daughters. And, and, and you know, you, you have that apprehension. Whereas in the perfect world that God created, that did not exist. The possibility of hurt, the possibility of pain, the possibility of interruption of all what is good did not exist. We can't fathom that. Amazing. Now, coming back to Genesis, despite all this goodness of God and that he had shown that he, he was the creator, the provider for everything that was good, why then, then did Eve and Adam consequently not trust him? It doesn't make sense, right? Did, had God given them any evidence for them to distrust him. He had not. However, the enemy was very subtle. The enemy was very subtle. And let's go to Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 1. In fact, it says here in the New King James Version, Now the serpent was more, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. 
Then the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The only way that Satan could lead them to distrust God at this point was to point them to something even better that there was that God was withholding from them because everything was good. So the only thing he could say is, this is really good, but there's something even better that he created in that tree, but for some reason he's telling you, you can't have that one. Now, let's pause there. As I was growing up, uh, I had a cousin sister. I have a cousin sister. And I, it's a cousin sister because she's a cousin, blood related, she's a cousin. But my parents uh, raised her up. When I was two years old, she came home, so I don't have cognizance of when she came to our home. For me, she just was there, you know. In the beginning, in my beginning, she was there, and my sister. So anyways, as I grew up, I eventually realized that, oh, she has other siblings that are not my siblings who are my cousins, so how does that work out? So eventually my parents clarified the issue. She's five years older than I am, and when she, um, when she was 15 years old, my parents always had people living in our home, uh, theology students and other people. In fact, one time they even had two ladies who were drug addicts that they picked from the street and they, my dad was trying to help. Um, that has its pros and it has its cons. In any case, uh, I won't go into the story of the cons that we experienced, but uh, one of those theology students who was, you know, like 23 years old, he set his eyes on my sister, who was just 15. And, uh, well, she, she was pretty big, you know, and she looked, uh, she was, not because she's my cousin's sister, but she was beautiful. And he set her eyes on her and started befriending her in a way that was more than just a, a, a casual, appropriate friendship between someone who's 23 and a 15-year-old girl. There was a romantic uh, chemistry there which she was struck by, fascinated, and became, she was captivated, captivated. Um, my brother and I noticed it, and uh, we, we were not very happy with it. You know, when you're a sibling and you see that someone is stealing the affection of your older sister, you don't like that. You're very jealous of that. But in any case, I, I just told her, why are you in love with that man? What has he done for you? In fact, eventually, uh, and I can't tell the whole story, eventually she got married with him, but it was, it was quite a journey because my parents were trying to have her wait until she was 20. You know, she was just uh, underage. And they wanted her to achieve goals. They wanted her to finish high school, at least, and go to college. They wanted her to learn music. And to make a long story short, uh, uh, she did not complete any of those goals, uh, but she did get married. She has a good home, but uh, I know that I know for a fact that she regretted not accomplishing certain goals before that. She does. She did regret that uh, very clearly. But, you know, in that process, I would tell her, why? Why? And uh, I couldn't fathom why when we reach a certain age, the most, the love of your parents, the best interest is not enough to convince a young man, a young lady, that when their parents say something, it's the best for them, especially if they're Christian, God-fearing parents. But the devil does something with our minds because when I became her, not 15, but uh, when I was 18, 19, I started having the same struggles. My parents were like, no, son, you know, that young lady is not the best for you. And I was like, why not? And uh, <laughs> insisting. So, you know, when I have uh, some conversations with a few of you that, that venture to talk to me, you know, I know that most of you see me like some... Uh, you know, the president, I can't talk to him. But a few of you have broken that barrier, and we're just friends, and that's great. But I can relate, because I was there. I was there. And you see, my parents used different methods to discourage me from going in the wrong direction, and I did not like those methods. One of those methods at one time 
was that they removed from me, you know, uh, the keys of the car. I could not drive anymore. And, and you know, at that age, to not let you drive, that's, oh, that's pretty bad. They removed from me every single responsibility they had entrusted me with. And furthermore, I was 18, 19 years old. We lived in a, on a campus. And one time, my dad even did this to me. You can't go further. You can't go beyond where I can see you because if you do, you know, you get into yourself into trouble. So we would walk to chapel and had to walk three feet in front of him. No more than three feet. Now imagine you're an 18-year-old and, and you're here, you're walking through campus and you're three feet in front of your dad and, and you're looking at other people. What do you think is going through your, your system? No? So the devil comes and tells you, look at the methods. There are wrong methods. Therefore, they're being selfish. Therefore, what they're telling you to do is not really good. And he uses the, the methods that often are not the best methods, and sometimes they're altogether wrong. We have to recognize parents make mistakes. But we look at the methods. The devil makes us look at the methods so that we will reject the truth. We will reject the truth. And it's, so here the devil uses that argument, you know, why did he say no of that tree? Doesn't he make everything perfect? It must be that he is withholding something good from you. And uh, let me just read what the book Education says in response to that in the chapter, The Knowledge of Good and Evil, chapter 3. It says, and we will go further on this, Eve, infatuated, flattered, beguiled, did not discern the deception. Infatuated, flattered, and beguiled. She coveted what God had forbidden. She distrusted his wisdom. She cast away faith, the key of knowledge. Tomorrow we shall continue. Let's have a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we know that we are in a great controversy. We know that the devil is very subtle, and he is constantly seeking us to cast away faith, the key of knowledge, the key of the towards the wisdom of God and the power of God. Lord, as we study together this week, we want to strengthen our trust and believe in Thee, our Creator, our Father, our Redeemer, who wants the best for us. This is our prayer and supplication that we may increase in faith in Thee. In the name of Jesus, amen. What a wonderful and educative message, isn't it? So we want to thank our online viewers for joining us through the streaming. And we want to invite you to come and join us tomorrow at the same time. May God bless you.